Okay, we can finish what we need to talk about. Oy, oy, oy. Okay, that's a 40 slide slide deck. Cool. Oh, I should probably actually turn on the screen. Okay, very put together today. Thank you all so much for your patience. Um, yeah, all right. <clears throat> I am lectured, the sound is sounding. Let's just jump in. Okay, updates. Uh, your exams are graded. I just don't think I've posted them yet. So I'll do that when I'm done talking here. Uh, I lost power last night and didn't get it back until like an hour ago. So I was a bit of a mess. <laughs> Been a bit of a mess. But uh, we're trying to uh, not be. So basically, uh, I think lab four also needs grading, but that'll take me like 20 minutes. So hopefully by the end of the day, you'll have your exam and your lab uh, published and graded. Uh, you'll for sure have the exams. I'll literally do that when we finish here. For the exams, uh, <clears throat> honestly, what I'd say about the exams, um, definitely you wanna review addressing modes <clears throat> and you wanna review assembly. It was by far the pinchiest pinch point of the exam. Uh, there was a lot of struggle around what the specific addressing modes were, how to define them, and how that related to the underlying assembly of your programs. Um, and I think that's going to be something everyone sees when they get back their exams. Um, I don't think anyone's watching online right now, so um, not, you know, few of us here, small number. So there are like 90 plus exams. So, um, you know, don't, this doesn't necessarily apply to everybody. Don't want to make it sound like it does. Um, but that is kind of the thing that I will say about that. Um, so that's our exam, but overall, solid. Wasn't like everyone failed. They did not. A pretty solid average, pretty respectable one at that. Um, but that was the <clears throat> biggest pinch point. Pinch point was absolutely was the memory addressing modes for loads and stores alongside with actually assembling programs. But I think most of the assembly struggle came from the load store operations and how the addressing modes um, and the offsets worked. So that's kind of the most in the weeds thing uh, that was, I think, on the exam. There was some other stuff that's kind of in the weeds, but that's the thing that I thought was the thing that I wanted to mention because that's gonna come up on the final. I don't think that's a surprise that the cumulative final is gonna have one of the biggest chunks of the previous exam show up again. So that would definitely be something when you get back your exam and review them, uh, if that was a bit of a pinch point for you, you're not alone, and that's something that I, I would recommend uh, doubling down on and, and reviewing. Uh, did I? I graded in, did I grade lab three in post lab three? Or no? Okay. Basically, if I haven't done that, I will sure as hell do that tonight and probably lab four. Um, those are easy to grade. I just truly don't know what I have or haven't done, uh, which is probably not uh, the greatest. This is why I write code to grade everything for me. Right? You can trust that your grades are good because I'm not grading them. The machine is grading them. <laughs> Uh, oh, it is? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Um, but see, the fact that I was like, oh, well, I guess it's not, you know, so it's kind of the same point. So anyway, <clears throat> that is going to be, uh, so lab three is there, so that just means lab four needs to get posted. Uh, unit six, seven has been, I think, graded as well. I don't know if that's posted to Canvas. I don't think it is. I will, basically what I'm saying is by the end of the day today, you should have a lot more grades than you do right now. I just, a lot of it's done. I just need to post it all. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I had to grade my other courses set of exams and I'm not quite done with those. So uh, that's kind of uh, the summary of all that. So kind of with all that being said, um, I actually have a question for you. So we have a lecture today and then that's it. And we are gonna have a lecture Thursday because I'm indulgent and I want to brag. And that is what Thursday's lecture is going to be. Um, it is just going to be me showing off personal projects that I built mostly in assembly. I might bring my laptop, my Linux machine, if that's of interest to anybody. If anyone wants to see what it looks like to build a custom Linux device from a bare minimal install up. Um, I think I figured out a way to stream it through OBS. Um, it's laggy. We can live with that. 
So I'm probably going to do that on Thursday. Thursday is going to be me looking at the Gen 1 Pokemon games, the modifications that I made a few years ago now, and my Linux machine I've been building the past couple of months. And that's just going to be funsy. So just come if you're interested in that sort of thing. Uh, anyone else who's in this course and doesn't normally come in person, if there's a day to come in person, it's probably on Thursday. I'm going to have some fun with it. But that leaves us with a full week of classes afterwards before our final on the last day of our classes on April 29th, I think is the date, but it's that Tuesday, um, which is in fact the 30th, so I'm glad I looked. So our final exam is going to be on April 30th. We have a lecture today and Thursday, so that gives us next week. And next week, we're gonna do an exam review, and I'm gonna cancel class, because I think we've earned that. So, do we want to do an exam review on Tuesday next week and then no class on Thursday or vice versa? Doesn't matter to me. What are you guys thinking? You want to get the uh, free day on Tuesday or Thursday? Mm -hmm. Tuesday? Tuesday. And then review Thursday and then have it fresh in your mind for the final? Sure. Okay. See, this is why I ask. I would have assumed the opposite and I would have been wrong. So, thank you. That will be official come our weekly announcement at the start of next week, and I will confirm that, but next week all we're doing is a review session, and so next Tuesday uh, we will not have class, and next Thursday we will do our review. Thank you all for your input there. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's it. We are really at, but this is the last lecture. Thursday it's stuff I've done with assembly, and some Linux stuff, but hey, it's a precursor to OS, which is kind of what this class is supposed to be, so it kind of counts. And then next Tuesday, no class, next Thursday, review, and then it's our final, and then we're done, and we're out of here. Project five, or lab five is also due somewhere in that slosh, probably near the end of the semester, probably at the end of next week, if I had to guess. So we've got lab four, which should be kind of getting finished up. I think the grade scope's open till tomorrow. And then we have lab five, which continues on the trend of taking the same basic concept and expanding it a little bit. Lab five is just lab four, but with a little uh, input output, right? Lab four assumes you want to sum only the odd numbers, whereas lab five, you determine if you want to sum the even or the odds based on user input. And for those of you who are looking for a challenge, you get, I think it's an extra 25 bonus points if you can get your assembly code printing out in ASCII the numeric value that you summed. It's a bit much. So if you're swamped, uh, unless you find that more fun than the other things you're swamped by, probably not. Um, but it is doable. It's not impossible. There's one or two tricks that once you kind of realize, it's not as bad. But that's kind of my assessment of the situation. And if you have questions about it, including the bonus, feel free to reach out. I like talking about this. I know I complain that I'm like really busy all the time, which I am. But like answering those questions is like the part that I enjoy doing. <laughs> and the bureaucratic slosh I have to do is the stuff I don't. So please don't feel like you're, you know, kind of adding stuff to my plate. No, this is the stuff I would much rather be doing, is helping you guys understand and learn the concepts. So it's like the thing I enjoy doing. Um, I'm overworked because I have to, you know, also push pencils sometimes. So, but please don't, don't hesitate to reach out. <clears throat> Answering y'all's questions is the reason I do this gig. Um, so yeah, if you've got them, just let me know. Anyway, that's enough of me preaching at the start of the semester, or at the start of class. Let's talk about virtual memory today, all right? So basically, let me, okay, I hit the whiteboard, that's my cue. So basically, when it comes to virtual memory, our kind of question becomes, what is this, what is the point, and what are we talking about? Okay, so I want to kind of set this up, and then I'm going to, attempt to go through this lecture slide deck without going absolutely insane. So we talked earlier in the past two lectures about cache memory, right? And we talked about it in the concept of the trip from the CPU to main memory to RAM is relatively a pretty long journey, right? And the CPU runs a lot faster than we can retrieve instructions and data from main memory. So the idea is to leverage the principle of locality, both uh, spatteral and temporal. I'm adding a syllable there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and 
to leverage those two versions of locality in order to grab recent and likely needed, recent, likely soon again needed data and instructions and store them in cache memory which is closer to the CPU and can be accessed faster. The idea being that if something is in a cache, we can quickly access it rather than going all the way to main memory, all right? But the issue kind of that we uh, saw at the end of lecture last Thursday was that these caches are relatively small, right? You can only store a small fragment of the data that you can store in all of main memory inside of one of these caches. So we have to have some type of scheme or algorithm to you know, evict or kick out data from the cache and put new data into the cache. Okay? And that's kind of the underlying premise. The premise of caching is that idea, is the idea that we have smaller little repositories of computer memory that store recently needed or likely to be needed data and instructions. So what does this have to do with virtual memory? Okay. What it has to do with virtual memory is when we talk about RAM, when we talk about our random access memory, all of our conversations up to this point have assumed we'll have enough. Right? We assume that all the instructions and data that we need throughout our computer's execution can fit into main memory. But what if that's not the case? What if we are executing so many different applications, programs, whatever, that the entire space of main memory is no longer enough to store all of the information that it needs to store? That's where virtual memory concepts come from. This is about as close to downloading more RAM as you can get. It's not very close, but it's as close as you're gonna get. So anyway, before I start ranting and raving, I'm going to talk a little bit about a setup, and then we're gonna jump into why we use this. But the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to update my lecture slides. <laughs> so, <clears throat> basically, the way we have been talking about memory addressing up to this point is a system which uses physical addressing. This is what the LC3 uses. It is basically the idea that the CPU communicates directly with main memory. So in the LC3, right, the CPU uh, sent a memory address to the memory address register, the MAR, and then it told memory, query this. And you know, memory would take the address in the MAR, find the data at that address, and then put the resulting data in the MDR, which the CPU would then load into, you know, some location, maybe a register, maybe the IR instruction register, what have you. But the point was that the CPU directly talked to main memory. It sent addresses to the MAR and it retrieved data from the MDR. Now, that's good for the LC3, right? It's a learning computer and, I, you know, and having the CPU talk to memory is a lot simpler and it allows us to focus on the important issues at hand. But it does turn out that this mechanism in 2024 <laughs> is only really seen in cost-reduced or super simple hardware. Most modern machines, like your phones, your laptops, do not do this for a variety of reasons. Okay? <clears throat> what they do instead is they use something called virtual addressing. Okay? So instead of physical addressing, where the CPU talks directly with main memory, you have virtual addressing. Okay? where what happens is the CPU talks to the MMU and the MMU talks to main memory. The MMU, memory management unit. Okay, almost didn't have that one. So the MMU is the memory management unit and it is a special chip whose entire job is to translate fake memory addresses into real ones. What do I mean by that? So what virtual addressing is, is you're basically 
spinning a little yarn, telling a little fiction. You are telling the CPU, hey, you have access to these memory addresses from this range to that range. And those addresses don't necessarily correspond to any addresses in main memory. Okay? The job of the MMU, the memory management unit, is to translate virtual addresses into physical addresses. Physical addresses being the physical address in main memory in the actual RAM module. A virtual address is just some address, all right? And so the idea behind an MMU is that the CPU takes a virtual address, gives it to the MMU, the MMU translates that to a physical address, and then goes to main memory and talks to main memory, okay? Now, that is the main system, yeah. So <clears throat> that's a great question. How does this create more memory? It doesn't create more physical memory. But what this does allow us to do is lie to the CPU. And we can leverage that to make the CPU think there is more memory than there actually is. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of pull the curtain back on how that works. But like, that's the premise here. If we're lying to the CPU about what memory addresses it's storing and loading stuff from, then we can kind of exaggerate that lie pretty far in order to make things that would be rather complicated seem seamless to the CPU. Like if we have two gigs of RAM, but we would like to tell the CPU we have 16, we can just tell the CPU it has 16 gigs of RAM. And the CPU can act as if it has 16 gigs of RAM. And every time it sends an address, a virtual address to the MMU, the MMU is responsible for translating that to one of the real addresses in the two gigabytes. But in theory, it's kind of like a cache, right? If the CPU thinks it can access 16 gigs worth of stuff, then it's the MMU's job to make sure that the subset of data the CPU is accessing is actually in main memory. And if it wants to access a chunk that's not in main memory, it's got to go fetch it from somewhere, put it in main memory, so that the CPU can access it. This is kind of the point. We'll get into the details of how all this stuff works. But the point really is that the MMU is a middleman between CPU and memory. And by having a man in the middle, you can lie to the CPU about what it's doing, and the CPU will be none the wiser, as opposed to having to have the CPU do all this work. You can keep your CPU in the dark and let the MMU handle all the hard stuff, all the heavy lifting. Yeah? Is the MMU only talking to one particular memory, or does it talk to everything? Let's say that the MMU is only talking to main memory. Right, like your RAM. It's not talking to any of the registers or any of the cache. Okay? It's talking to main memory, and as we'll see, it might talk to the hard drive, but I'll get to that. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. So basically, <clears throat> okay. I don't want to get too into this, but you basically have virtual address space and physical address spaces, right? You basically have the idea that you have the virtual addresses, all the addresses that the MMU says you have, and you have all the physical addresses, the addresses that are actually present in the main memory. And because virtual addressing and physical addressing are distinct, and the MMU just translates between the two, this allows for some interesting things to happen. For example, an object could have multiple addresses, right? You could store an object in main memory once, and then have multiple memory, virtual memory addresses point to the same physical location in memory. That's not super important from the context that we have, but in a situation where different processes have small subsets of memory available, memory protection, the idea that a physical thing in main memory could be you know, connected to multiple virtual addresses that different programs have access to is a convenient trick. Again, this is gonna be more important in operating systems, so I don't wanna get too into the weeds with context you don't have yet. It's kind of a weird place to talk about this, but it's better than anywhere else, really. So this is kind of the idea. We have the virtual addresses that the CPU is going to think about and live with and exist with, and it's gonna to talk to the memory management unit, 
And it's the MMU's job to translate those virtual addresses into physical addresses in main memory. So why? This, I think, is good. So it uses main memory more efficiently, right? So I'm ignoring use DRAM as a cache. It just it allows main memory to be used more efficiently, and it simplifies memory management. So here's one thing I want to say. The MMU makes a lot less sense from the context we're coming from, where the LC3 ran one program and then terminated. And in that world, an MMU does not make much sense. It doesn't really need to manage your memory when you just have one program talking to memory back and forth. But modern computers tend to have multiple programs or applications running at the same time. And so you have multiple programs that all want main memory for different reasons. And so when we say it uses main memory more efficiently, the MMU allows it so that individual programs don't have to think, oh, where in main memory am I going? And am I bumping into anyone else? Instead, the MMU deals with that. The MMU can tell every program, hey, you've got a memory address from 1,000 to 2,000. And it can figure out where the hell in main memory it actually wants to put that. And it can organize that data better. Yeah? Each program has the same memory as from 1 to 2,000, or like 1 is from 1 to 2,000, the other one is 2,000? So from the perspective of virtual memory, every program just has from 1,000 to 2,000, right? And those numbers are just made up, but that's the idea. If it's virtual memory, right, we can tell each program they have whatever virtual addresses we want, okay? And we can basically make it so that the addresses we give our programs are addresses they know how to work with. That's the main thing. Where in memory doesn't really matter, but we basically have the ability to say, okay, program, is it easier for you to be in the top half of memory? Then let's pretend you're in the top half of memory. Here are some virtual addresses that make you think that's where you are. And where it actually ends up in main memory isn't relevant. It's up to the, mem the MMU, the memory management unit, to figure out where all that stuff goes. And so if one program only needs a few hundred slots of memory, but another program needs a few thousand, the MMU can recognize that and organize them in main memory how it wants so that you use every slot effectively. Okay, I know I'm being very abstract here, but that's just the reality when we're not in an OS class. The other thing is that it simplifies memory management um, <clears throat> because you're managing memory in your own little virtual addressing world. You don't get to touch actual main memory. And this, lastly, the most important one, isolates address spaces. So if you give each program their own little blip of virtual addresses, and they try and access a virtual address that they do not have permission to access, the MMU, the memory management unit, can tell that program to get bent no thank you, get lost. No data for you. Whereas with direct memory addressing, if you have a program that can talk directly to main memory, that program can say, no, but actually I would like the data at this memory location. And if that's not a memory location it's supposed to interact with, too bad, right? And so that's one of the other major benefits of virtual memory is that it makes it so that each program has its own set of virtual addresses and the middleman, the MMU, can you know, tell a program to buzz off if it tries to access data outside the range it was given. This is really important because A, it means that different programs can't interfere with each other. Microsoft Word can't start corrupting the data of Steam and crashing the game that you're playing. Back in the 90s, that's what happened. One application would just go rogue and start changing main memory for everybody, including the operating system. And that would break the computer, and you'd need to restart, and you'd lose all your data. So having a memory management unit <clears throat> that prevents programs from accessing data they're not allowed to access makes things more stable. And it makes things more secure because a user program can't go and access 
operating system data because the MMU, the memory management unit, the middleman, will see that a program is trying to access a virtual memory address it's not allowed to access, and it will just reject the request outright. Right? The MMU has a brain, main memory doesn't. Main memory just takes an address, finds the data at that address, and gives you the data back. Right? MMU's not thinking beyond that. Or excuse me, the main memory's not thinking beyond that. The point of the MMU is to be a bit of a bodyguard, to think, oh, this virtual address comes from this program, well, they do have the legal right to access this data. So I'll go talk to main memory about this. Oh, this program wants this data? Oh, they're not allowed to have that. Yeah, good luck, goodbye. Here's all zeros. Here's an error message. Go deal with that. Right? That's the main benefit. So let's start by talking about VMs as a tool for caching. Oh, my God. Okay, sure. <clears throat> so, virtual memory is an array of n contiguous bytes stored on disk. The contents of the array on disk are cached in physical memory. These cache blocks are called pages. So, let's translate that. Basically, the idea is that we can break up main memory into series of just chunks that we call pages, okay? So a page is just a chunk of data that gets stored in RAM. And the idea is that virtual memory is just an array of pages. Okay? All of the pages that the system needs. So that is all of the pages or memory chunks every program on the hardware is using, accessing, needing. Okay? And so, <clears throat> the idea is that in virtual memory, we can just think of all of the pages listed out in order, linearly. But virtual memory can have more pages than there are slots for pages in physical memory. And so the job of the memory management unit is to basically take specific pages of virtual memory and place them into main memory. <clears throat> okay? And the idea... Oh, that's so dumb. So the idea here is that if we want to access data, right, we can just talk to the main memory to access the specific page of memory that we want. But if that page is not present in main memory, then we can go to wherever the rest of the virtual memory pages are stored and load the page in to main memory. This is the same principle that the caching that we saw last Thursday utilized, right? For the cache, when the CPU wanted to access main memory, we put caching between the CPU and main memory so that the most recent data could just be accessed quicker, right? And it turns out that we actually kind of use the main memory for a similar purpose. Virtual memory is all the potential memory pages that the system has to offer, and for convenience, the system offers more pages than there are physical slots in main memory. And it is up to the system to recognize which pages are needed and put them into main memory and which pages aren't being used right now and store them somewhere else, traditionally the hard drive. Okay, So that's the idea. We have more main memory pages than we can fit into main memory, so we fit all the pages we can fit into main memory and all the ones we can't, we store on the hard drive. So in effect, we kind of use main memory as a cache <laughs> where the data that can't fit in the cache is stored on the hard drive. Okay. That's kind of the idea with virtual memory as a tool for caching. So DRAM cache organization is driven by the enormous miss penalty. DRAM is about 10 times slower than SRAM, but disk is about 100,000 times slower than DRAM. I think you could cut that number in half with a solid state drive but 5,000 times slower is still pretty damn slow. So basically what we're saying here is that the penalty 
when we're talking about like an L1 and L2 cache between the CPU and main memory, the penalty for looking in the cache near the CPU and not finding something is about tenfold. Right? It's 10 times faster to find the data in the CPU cache than it is to go and access it from main memory. But when it comes to accessing data from main memory or from the hard disk, if the data we're looking for isn't in main memory, it'll take five to 10,000 times longer to go fetch it from the hard drive. <clears throat> so what we're basically saying is that the principles underlining these concepts are very similar. But because of the constraints here, we really want to eliminate misses in main memory as much as we possibly can. Because if we look for a page of memory in you know, RAM in main memory and it's not there, it's going to take a long time to go get it out of the hard drive and put it into main memory. Okay. I'm ignoring most of this jargony garbage, and I'm going to suss out highly sophisticated, expensive replacement algorithms too complicated and open-ended to be implemented in hardware. So basically what we are saying here is that in CPU caching, we tend to take quick and dirty algorithms to determine if a piece of data should be in the cache or should get kicked out of the cache. Because the miss rate, the penalty for, not, for something not being in the cache is only about 10 times slower. It's not the hugest deal if we miss something in the cache. Whereas because the miss <clears throat> for something not being in main memory is so much more extreme, we tend to have really sophisticated, complex replacement algorithms in order to deal with this. This is a big part of what your operating system's job is going to be. Your operating system is going to be in charge of managing virtual memory. It's going to be in charge of being like, okay, what pages should be in physical memory and what pages should be in the hard drive. The MMU is the physical chip responsible for handling this, but the algorithm and who makes the call of what pages go where is something your operating system is responsible for. And that's just a super complicated ass thing, okay? So that's kind of the concept that we're building off here. So, doo -doo -doo. so this is just an example of this that I am uh, gonna try not to butcher. <laughs> so basically the idea is we have a page table, uh, which is an array of page table entries that maps virtual pages to physical pages. Um, per process kernel data structure in DRAM, whatever, man. So basically the idea is we have this page table, it's stored somewhere in RAM, and it's used to associate physical pages with their current locations, okay? So what we're basically saying here is that we have a bunch of pages here on the left, and we have all of this being kind of virtual memory. On the bottom right hand corner, we see that there are seven pages of virtual memory. That's VP for virtual memory page. Not great, but that's what it's trying to communicate. And then what we can see is the physical page number or disk address. So what this is basically saying here is it is a list of all of the virtual memory pages and it's telling you where they all are. So for all of the ones where PTE is zero, that's basically saying that that virtual page is not in main memory, okay? And if it's not in main memory, it has to be on the hard drive. But the remaining table tells us slot one, two, four, and seven are all in physical memory somewhere. And this page tells us where. So this page is used to associate virtual memory addresses with their current location in physical memory. Yes, one, two, three, four, five, six. Sure, 
and you just skip that ambiguity. So the idea is a page hit is a reference to when we look for a page and we find it in physical memory, right? We look for a page, we find it in physical memory. It's there, it's fast, it's quick, no questions, no problems. So we have a virtual address, which we go and we look up at the page table. We find that the virtual address translates to a page in physical memory. So the MMU can then just go to physical memory, get the data we need, and give it to our program. A page fault is a reference to virtual memory that is not in physical memory. So here, if we get the virtual address of this page right here, which we can see is on the hard drive somewhere, but is not actually present in physical memory, we know we have a page fault. We are looking for a page in memory which is not in memory. So what do? Well, to handle a page fault, a page fault handler selects a victim to be evicted. Computer scientists have been picking the worst terminology for literally everything. I genuinely cannot get over it. Um, <clears throat> and so here, the page fault handler, which is just a very cute way of saying super complicated algorithm we're not getting into right now. The page fault handler selects uh, a page to be evicted from physical memory. In this case, it just picks VP4. And, okay, and then it swaps them in, all right? And now basically what it's saying is it says that page three is now slotted in physical memory and page four is copied back to the hard drive. And so now if we look up this virtual address a second time, if we want to access page number three, we take the virtual address for page three go to the uh, lookup table, we find that page three is now in fact in main memory. So we access that data and we retrieve it and send it off. Page hit. So a concept here that I wanna kind of note is that this behaves in the same way as caching in the sense that if there is a miss, it does not get the data from you know, the farther away place and then give you that data. If there is a miss, it stops the instruction, finds out what data you needed, loads it from the farther away place into the closer place, and then reruns that instruction a second time, knowing that now that you've moved data around, the second time you execute this, it won't be a miss, but it will be a hit. It's a subtlety, but that's how both of them are operating. So, this is <clears throat> at the highest of high levels, and I know I'm skimming over this and not doing a great job going into detail, um, but this is the concept of virtual memory. The idea that because we can have virtual addresses, we can have a virtual address space that is larger than the physical address space we have access to. And as a result of that, we can store all of the virtual memory on the hard drive and then take a subset of that memory and store as much as we can of that subset into physical memory. Right? The idea that we have more virtual memory than we have physical memory, so we store the virtual memory that we can't fit onto the hard drive and all of the, virtual, er, all of the memory we can fit into physical memory. And then whenever we want to go get a piece of data, we get a virtual address, we look it up in this table to see if the page we're trying to access is or is not in physical memory. If it's in physical memory, we access it, boom, we get our data, no problems. If it's not in physical memory, we need to have a little journey to the hard drive to get the page we need, put it into physical memory, typically by evicting a page that was already there. And then once we plop the page we need into physical memory, we can check the address again and we can find the page we want in physical memory, retrieve it, and then send it off to whoever asked for it. Okay? <sighs> yeah. So, that's virtual memory for caching, and I hope I didn't totally botch that explanation. So, virtual memory works because of locality, right? The same way that the CPU cache works because of locality, Virtual memory caching works because of locality. 
At any point in time, programs tend to access a set of active virtual pages called the working set. Programs with better temporal locality will have smaller working sets and thus be more memory efficient in a virtual memory system. So if the working set size is less than the main memory size, you get good performance for one process after compulsory misses. Basically, if you have virtual memory that a process is talking to, at first, none of the data is going to be in main memory. And it's going to miss, and you're going to have to get all the pages you need into main memory. But once they're all there, if the working set, i.e. the set of pages that the program needs regularly, is smaller than the main memory size, then we're all good. Once we fill those pages we need into main memory, everything's just going to roll. We're going to keep accessing those pages in main memory because they're going to keep being there and no problems. But if the working set size becomes larger than main memory itself, that's when we have what is typically a calamitous result, which is something called thrashing. A performance meltdown. I love how dramatic whoever wrote these slides was. A performance meltdown where pages are swapped in and out continuously. And remember, going to the hard drive is a hell of a long time relatively in computer time. It takes five to 10,000 times longer than just talking to main memory. So if every time we need to access main memory, we're going to the hard drive, we're basically making accessing main memory five to 10,000 times slower, which is going to absolutely geek your computer, absolutely destroy it. So I have an example for this. I can actually do practically, so I'm going to do it. So I have my uh, Mac OS activity monitor here, and I want to draw your attention to something called memory pressure. Memory pressure is a quirky little thing that Mac OS does. No one else really does it, I don't think. But the concept is important all the same. Memory pressure here is referring to how much physical memory a machine has and how much of that memory is actually being used. The idea is, roughly speaking, if the memory pressure is in the greens, then you've got physical memory available so you don't have to worry about you know, running out of space. You've got room for more pages to be put in physical memory. But once memory pressure gets to the yellow color, once the graph gets a little higher, what that's basically saying is main memory is full. All right. So if you need something, you need to evict a page and put it onto the hard drive and then load the page you need into physical memory. Now, that isn't necessarily all that bad of a thing, right? Most programs, because of the principles of locality, once they get the data they need, they're going to just start being able to access that data and not need to go talk to the hard drive anymore. Yeah? When you said that the memory is full, it means that the main memory and the hard drive? Just the main memory. And how can you still save some stuff in the hard drive? So, Basically, the hard drive has to have free space on it. So the idea is that if physical memory is full, then if we need a virtual memory page that isn't in physical memory, we have to take a page out of main memory, save it onto the hard drive, and then take the page we want from the hard drive and put it into physical memory. All right? So that's kind of the idea. The idea is that we have some amount of physical memory that is stored up with pages and the pages that don't fit are stored on the hard drive, OK? And so in a situation where physical memory is full, it's not necessarily a problem. It might be full, but everybody's using the data that they need. And it's only on occasion that you need to evict a page to get a different page. And if that's the case, then your machine's still probably going to chug along just fine. Not really going to have a huge performance issue. Yeah, sometimes you'll need to go evict a page and get another one from main memory, and that does take a little longer. You'll see some performance degrade, but that's not a huge issue. But when your memory pressure spikes up to the red, what you're basically saying is not only is physical memory full, but programs are actively trying to read memory that they can't fit inside of the physical memory. 
So when the memory pressure is up in the reds, you have programs that are kind of constantly paging in and out. You're constantly reading data in from the hard drive and sending data out of physical memory back to the hard drive and repeating that process over and over. This is also why memory leaks cause such slowdowns on computers. Because if your application is leaking memory, i.e. allocating memory and never saying I don't need it anymore, what's going to happen is it's going to basically fill up an entire page in physical memory. And when that page is full, it's going to need another page to write more data to. And it's going to need to keep having new pages that it can write its data to. You know, and it can't get rid of any of these pages because it's a poorly written program and it hasn't signaled to the operating system that it doesn't need the old pages. It acts like it needs all of them. So it keeps making new pages while also saying, hoarding, basically. I need all the ones I've already made. Yeah, I'm making more and more pages and I'm going to keep all of them. Do not touch. And when you have that situation, main memory tends to fill up very quickly with a bunch of garbage shit. And you create a situation where an application keeps being like, I need a new page, I need a new page, I need a new page. So you force the operating system to copy page after page after page out of main memory onto the hard drive and pull page after page after page into physical memory. And that slows things down a lot. So the only time I've ever really had this happen to me IRL is every once in a while I've been playing a video game on Steam on my desktop and it has a bit of a memory leak. There's not enough RAM to support whatever game thing I'm doing. And when the amount of physical memory space becomes zero, that means every time I need to access main memory, I am probably evicting a page, going to the hard drive, and retrieving a page to put it in to physical memory. And that is going to slow your computer down to a crawl, because every single time you have to go to the hard drive to access a piece of data rather than just the physical main memory, it's going to take an extra five to 10,000 times longer. And again, imagine we're accessing memory a few hundred or a few thousand times a second. So, you know, if, if every access took a tenth of a second, times that by 10,000, you know, every access is now taking 10 seconds. That is an elevation of time that you as a human will notice. You'll notice it a lot. So that, uh, I don't know, that's, 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 that's a rough idea of what's going on, okay? I'm hoping the concepts, the, the concepts are really what I'm trying to get at, less than the physical implementation. When you get to OS, you can get in the weeds of how to implement this and how this all actually works. But I'm hoping that this gives some kind of like, just, rough idea of like, oh yeah, memory pressure. I sort of know what that is. It has something to do with pages. You know, like that's, that's kind of what I'm going for here. Um, doo -doo -doo. So that's virtual memory as a tool for caching. It allows us to, you know, basically pretend that there is more physical memory than there actually is. Also, I want to note that for caching, this is very beneficial for a lot of modern applications like, say, Firefox or Chrome. Because again, like the bad habit I am, I tend to keep open a Firefox with like 300 tabs, all right? Each tab has its own main memory requirements. But I'm not looking at all 300 tabs at once, right? Most of them are hidden away. And so the nice thing is, if I open up my Firefox with 300 tabs, the memory for 200 plus of those tabs can be stored on the hard drive. Because I'm not looking at that tab right now, that memory, while we need to keep it around in case I do open that tab, if the tab's not open, I don't need to be looking at that memory in that moment. So we can actually save space, right? We can tell Firefox you've got 32 gigs of memory, but because it doesn't need all 32 gigs at the same time, it only needs a gig at a time, it just uses those other 31 gigs to store data for tabs that you might open up later, you can offload that 31 gigs of data onto the hard drive while still telling Firefox it has 32 gigs and allowing Firefox to be comfortable with having 200 plus tabs open. Whereas if you told Firefox, hey man, you only get a gig of physical space and once you're out of that, there's no more room. 
Firefox wouldn't be able to open more than a handful of tabs before it complains, hey, there's no more room in main memory for me. I can't open a new tab. I don't know what I would do with all the data. Close a tab out first, free up some memory, and then I can open a new tab. But because we have virtual memory, if there's tabs that aren't closed, and we might need that memory later, but the tab isn't being seen physically right now, we can take all that tab's information, all those pages, and copy them onto the hard drive, freeing up space and physical memory. If we ever open that tab up again, we can just pull those pages back onto main memory. But if that tab stays closed for an hour or a month or a year, you know, Firefox still knows that data is there somewhere, it doesn't panic, it doesn't freak out, but it's not wasting space in physical memory, which is a scarce resource and it's a valuable one. Okay. Oh. 422, I've been ranting. So, um, I mentioned this a little bit. I don't think I'm going to go quite as in-depth. I wanted to go through the caching thing a little bit more just because it tied to the other caching we were talking about, and I think that's one of the more interesting things of virtual memory. Uh, VM as a tool for memory management, we're going to go a little quicker through. So basically, the key idea is that each process has its own virtual address space, and it can view memory as a simple linear array. Mapping function scatters addresses throughout physical memory because well-chosen mappings simplify memory allocation and management. So for, again, reasons that aren't super clear because the complexity we're talking about goes from the LC3 where everything is simple enough that we as just individuals can kind of look at, comprehend, and understand at least to a degree. We're talking about modern complex machinery. So I'm hand-waving a lot here because the jump in complexity from what we normally talk about to the, this unit is like huge. It's not, it doesn't fit super well here, but they wanted it somewhere so that you're not completely never seen this before, before smacking into OS, okay? So that's why this feels like a bit of a jump, it is. <clears throat> so that's kind of the rough idea though. If we have multiple programs, each one of them can have their own virtual address space, which just makes it from a programmer's perspective easier. Right? If your program just has a linear address space to work with, you as a programmer have less to think about when you're writing your code. Good. But the physical address space, we can move stuff around, put pages wherever the hell we want, so that the physical addresses can be utilized in the most efficient way possible. Why is you know, mishmashing all of these pages in physical memory more efficient? Great question. Don't have a good answer. But it is, all right? Usually from a lot of just convoluted, complicated reasons of, you know, different applications might see memory as linear, but then only access pages one, three, and nine. Even though they want the remaining pages, just in case they need them, they're only really talking to three of them. And you could, in theory, in physical memory, put those three pages next to each other and then just ignore the rest. Like, you've got a lot of options, is my point. Um, also, sharing code um, and data among processes. When you have virtual memory, as I kind of mentioned, you can theoretically have two different programs with two separate chunks of virtual memory, and you can associate two separate virtual memory chunks to the same piece of memory in main memory. This is really great because if two programs have their own virtual memory, they're not going to be able to talk to each other, right? The point of each program having virtual memory is to kind of isolate them from everyone else. And so by overlapping two virtual addresses to the same physical address, what you're basically doing is allowing either two programs to talk to each other by storing and receiving and reading and writing data to the same physical location, or in this example, Maybe both programs use the same read-only library. Maybe they both import the same standard library from C or Java or something. And virtual memory allows for that library to be stored in main memory one time and one time only and just have multiple virtual addresses point to that same library in main memory. So this prevents you from duplicating the same code in main memory, right? That's all I have for that. 
just kind of a rough concept. Again, this makes, this is gonna slot in better with OS when you actually talk about multiple processes and why you have them. I don't love that this is here, but this was what I was told to teach. And this is in the syllabus, so I can't cut it. Anyway, VM, virtual memory as a tool for memory protection. <laughs> this is the only slide. Oh man, extend PTEs with permission bits. If page fault handler checks these bits before remapping. I kind of already implied this with some of my earlier discussions. This is just saying you need more bits to do it. Basically, when it comes to virtual memory addresses, you can add a little extra information in the form of some extra bits to basically let everyone know what they're allowed to write and read to. So by doing this, you are basically saying, hey, program, you have some virtual memory here, and if you try and access a virtual address outside of it, you're not going to be allowed. So this is just really beneficial because it allows for you to have a lot more control over what parts of memory a specific program does or does not access. Okay? Again, I want to really emphasize that this is something that is kind of taken for granted in modern computing, but wasn't always the case. Modern computing, a program is given by the operating system a little chunk of data which it then executes, and it can't leave that little barrier space Otherwise, it gets yelled at, it gets told no. But before this system existed, a program could just read and write any piece of data anywhere in main memory, even if it was used by another program, even if that other program was the operating system. So not only does this make things very unstable, right, if your terrible program decides to go write data where the operating system is storing operating system stuff, right, you might break everything, everything crashes, everything goes up in flames. But even worse than that is there's a security implication. If any program can read and write any piece of data in main memory, it's not that you might accidentally override operating system data. Maybe somebody intentious, intentionally and maliciously adds a little extra code in the operating system so that it logs all your keystrokes and sends them back to a server somewhere, right? Because without memory protection, there's nothing stopping a random program that you open, that you download offline, from accessing the main memory where the operating system is being stored and changing the code that the operating system executes. Thus, allowing someone to put a virus or some other type of payload into your operating system without you even realizing it. Which for most of us isn't a big deal, well, actually, it would be. If virtual memory wasn't a thing, people would probably do this a lot more than they do. These days, trying to do something like that is so complicated because there's so many fences to jump over and walls to slide underneath or whatever that the only people who really do it are the people with enough resources, i.e. nation states. Individual programmers tend to not figure this stuff out. Like, it's just too much. You need too many puzzle pieces. There's too many gates to lockpick. Uh, any good programmer can probably pick a single lock on a single gate, but if you've got to get through 25 of them and not get detected, you're probably going to need a team. That team's probably going to need to be well-paid and well-motivated. And what better than a government paying well and the motivation being nationalism? And it's why you see a lot of the major attacks that come out these days that circumvent all these layers of security that the industry has built up over the past couple of decades almost always are attributed to some state actor. China, Israel, North Korea, the United States. These are the names that you see floating around as the purveyors, Russia, of massive um, security attacks, right? Because nobody else really has the resources to, to circumvent all of these uh, safety features. And that's a good thing, by the way, because with all these safety features, any random person with a laptop can start trying to break into your operating system and steal your data. We wouldn't, like the reason the internet is a broken fucking mess, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is that we learned that everything should be free because nobody could figure out how to do payments on the internet because nobody trusted their payments to not be intercepted and stolen. So the only way to make money on the internet was to sell ads. And then people became, had an expectation that things on the internet were free. 
And now they are, if you don't count that your entire data and livelihood and existence has now been quantified and shipped, packaged up, and sold. They had to make their money somehow. But like that causality, that chain of events is a big reason why we're in the world we're in now. People were not trusting of sending payment information over computers because computers weren't secure enough. The internet wasn't secure, individual computers weren't secure, and it was suspected and not unconvincingly suspected that if people were to send money over the internet, malicious actors could just steal it. So people didn't want to pay for things online because they didn't trust that their credit card info wouldn't get stolen or something. And so the internet's coming up, but no one wants to pay money because they don't, they, they, they don't think it's safe. So ads are what support most major websites in the birth of the internet. And that becomes the standard. And then Google, and now 2024 in our pretty dystopian internet world. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. It's some security flag. I don't know what it stands for. Um, yeah, I have no idea. I'm sure if you Google it, it's going to come up. A lot of these are general terms, but these aren't good slides, and they're a little over my head. That's why I'm kind of having a little loosey-goosey fun in like later April. I want to expose you guys to these concepts, but as you see on the study guide for Unit 9, I'm very explicit about what information this is going to show up on the final. Don't expect me to randomly be like, oh, what, what do these all mean? Like, I'm not going to do that to you guys. I know this is kind of a free form, kind of me kind of ranting a little bit, and the exams will correspond to that accordingly, okay? I know, I know if, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna give lectures like this, I'm not gonna expect you guys to, I mean, I'm gonna be very explicit about what information I want you to take from it, at least in terms of an exam and, and that type of explicit regurgitation. The rest of this, I hope, just sinks in enough to be interesting. Um, but yeah, lastly, uh, I talked about address translation, and we can kind of go through this a little bit, but this is kind of the end of it. I already mentioned this already. But the idea is the processor sends a virtual address to the memory managed unit. The memory managed unit fetches the uh, PTE from page table in memory. And then the MMU sends the physical address to the cache and memory. And then the actual data is sent back to the processor. So this is what I was describing. The only real extra step here is that the MMU first reads that table that I mentioned earlier from main memory, then looks at that table to determine where, oh, is this virtual address in physical memory or is it in the hard drive or whatever? And once it figures that out, if it's in main memory, the MMU just goes and tells main memory, hey, go get this data. And then the main memory sends that data right to the CPU. So basically, instead of the CPU asking memory and getting the data, the CPU asks the MMU. MMU does a few steps to verify, hey, is the data you want actually in the physical memory? Oh, it is? Cool, okay, here you go. And if it's a page fault, we do the first steps originally, right? Processor sends a virtual address to the MMU. The MMU fetches the page table entries from the page table in memory. But then, the valid bit is zero. We recognize that, oh, we looked at the page table entries, and the page we wanted is not in physical memory. So the MMU triggers an exception or something, right? And then what happens is the handler identifies a, identifies a page to be evicted. I'm not going to say victim. Fuck that, man. So basically, if the page we're looking for isn't in main memory, an exception is thrown. And the handler, which catches that exception, will then determine a page to evict from main memory. And then it will find the page it actually wants in the hard drive and copy that from the hard drive onto main memory. And then it will update the page table entries so that the page table entries indicates that the page that was evicted is no longer in main memory and the page that we copied in is now in main memory. And then, we rerun the instruction. And we, we redo that same um, memory access, except this time, the second time we do it, because we've done all of these steps, the data is actually going to be there. Oh. 
So you can put a cache between main memory. Oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, we've talked about how you put a cache between the CPU and main memory, and that's still true. It's just you put the MMU first because the CPU only knows virtual addresses and the cache <clears throat> is going to think in terms of real physical memory addresses. No, absolutely not. I'm not, I'm not talking about this. I'm done. This, this, this just, basically, if nothing else, this just starts to show the overwhelming complexity of this. You can have page tables in page tables. And I'm kind of, uh, this has already been a lot bigger than what this course was really built for. I really need to put some elbow grease in these slides. The memory stuff is fine, but the virtual memory is rough. And I appreciate y'all sticking through it. I'm not going to try and figure this shit out um, and go through. Yeah. Um, this might be a stupid question, but mm -hmm. is virtual memory, like, it's not real, right? It's like theoretical. Like, so, it doesn't have like an actual place. Yeah, it, so here's what I'll say about virtual memory. It doesn't have like an actual place, but typically all of the pages of virtual memory do exist. Yeah. It's just a matter of if they exist in the physical memory or if they're on the hard drive. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah that's the idea. That's the idea behind quote unquote virtual memory is that the addresses are made up and the addresses connect to a page that is either in physical memory or on the hard disk and it's up to the MMU and all this other infrastructure to basically coordinate what pages are in main memory and what pages are on the hard disk and moving them around if necessary. Yeah. And where is the virtual memory stored? So virtual memory, basically the addresses, like what virtual memory addresses connect to what physical addresses is all in the MMU. The actual pages themselves, the ones that can fit in physical memory, go in physical memory, but the ones that can't are stored on the hard drive. That's the thing about virtual memory. It encompasses all of the memory. Some of that's in physical, some of that's stored on the hard drive, all right? So that's the idea. It allows, at its core, virtual memory allows us to tell programs there's more memory than there actually is, and we can just kind of lie to those programs and have all this hardware behind the scenes recognize, oh, you're trying to get a page that isn't in physical memory, let me evict a page from physical memory, go to the hard drive, get the page you want, plop it in physical memory, ask again, now you'll find it, right? It's that kind of thing. It allows us to be more flexible, okay? So that's, yeah, I do like this. From the programmer's perspective, virtual memory um, means that each process has its own private linear address space which cannot be corrupted by other processes. So from a programmer's perspective, virtual memory guarantees that your program gets a little sliver of memory that is yours and yours alone, which is great because it's also really nice for one reason. It means no one can mess with your code, and it means that if you do something dumb, like, say, a memory leak where you're constantly creating garbage and not you know, getting rid of it, that's not going to crash other programs. You will run out of the virtual memory you've been given and then when you try and access more memory, the MMU will be like, no, no, no. You, you have this much memory you don't get anymore. And your program will crash, but just your program. Whereas without virtual memory, you might start accessing data that you're not supposed to, but still can technically, and you mess up everything for everyone else. Okay? So that's a nice benefit from a programmer's perspective. The worst case is you screw up your code and your code only. Because trust, you wouldn't, like, it's much better for your program to just crash than to crash and take the whole OS down with it, all right? People are gonna still be mad at you, but they're gonna be a lot more mad at you if, they, if you geek the whole OS, or hell, even corrupt it, right? You could crash the operating system, you could permanently break the damn thing, right? And people are gonna be big mad. Look, you can find forum posts from late 90s, early 2000s, they're still there, they're still kind of, in the intermediate stages of web rot and decay. And you can find people being like, hey man, downloaded the app, ran it, did something sort of weird, but not that weird, and now Windows won't boot. I needed to reinstall my operating system. Oi, fix this bug, asshole. Like, people get livid, and somewhat justifiably. That doesn't happen in 2024. You never download a program and then need to reinstall your OS afterwards. 
And if you ever do, you're almost certainly like, okay, I shouldn't have downloaded that. I had to click a lot of, are you sure, kind of prompts. And I said, fine, right? Whereas back in the day, without all this virtual memory stuff, yeah, you might have downloaded some, some guy's application, and it might have bripped your operating system. Not just crashed, bripped it. Overwrote data Microsoft needed to boot. And now Windows is completely geeked and you need to reinstall it. Which also was harder, because that was in the day where you need product keys for everything. Better hope you didn't lose yours. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's not too much of an exaggeration when it says the MMU was radical. Um, yeah, system it makes things better for the system. Yeah. <clears throat> what is the MMU structure most similar to? Like a CPU or what is that? Uh-uh. The MMU's structure is, it is its own piece of hardware. It's its own piece of hardware. The MMU is its own chip, it's its own piece of hardware that is explicitly designed to do the task of the MMU. The CPU is interesting because it's designed to be general purpose, right? It is able to take these instructions and do generic work with them. Whereas an MMU, it only has to do a very specific set of tasks. So the physical hardware can be designed to do those tasks, do them fast, do them well, and do nothing else. So the MMU is like a custom made chip. Yeah. Like, the, I, really, I really do want to reorient some of this back end um, to really try and, I need to talk with whoever's teaching OS, which has been a challenge, because <laughs> um, everyone's overworked here. But basically, I want this to off-ramp a little bit better, because the ramp up in complexity from like the LC3 to modern computing is like a cliff face truly is a cliff face. And while I don't want that to be so overwhelming that everyone takes an exam and fails it and gets all upset that they're being asked to like, you know, learn too much too quickly, which is a very reasonable thing, I also do like appreciating the scale of like, no, the LC3 is the basics. That is how everything works. But just like the LC3 can let us add some numbers together. If we want to do enough mathematics to get a 4K video streaming over the internet onto my phone and watch some dude, literally some of the mornings I wake up and there's this tech YouTuber guy who lives in North Carolina and he sets up a webcam outside of a bird feeder and just live streams it. And it's cute. He's got like, a, you know, woods in the backyard and a lot of cool birds coming through. And like, that is an insane amount of computational power on both ends of that and the network transmitting that at a pretty high rate of speed um, just so I can watch some fucking birds in a state below me get some bird feed every morning. Like it is actually kind of insane the amount of computational work that is done to do things that in our modern society are trivial and banal. And I really do like emphasizing that like the LC3, as we've learned it, is the building blocks. It is the foundation for all of that. Um, it's just the complexity really ramps up because if you want to make things as complicated and as fast and as secure as they need to be to run a live stream of a, you know, an active academic lecture and stream it over a network and then save those recordings and post them, like that takes a lot of data and that takes a lot of computational ability and so we have complex systems to handle that massive increase in data that we're handling, okay? I think I'll end it there before I just keep rambling, but that is the end of this, uh, this is the end of everything. Thank you so much for coming and sticking through, particularly y'all who are coming in person. I do appreciate not having to talk to an empty room. Um, so thank you all so much. We'll do a demo on Thursday. Next Tuesday, we won't have class. And then next Thursday, we, uh, or the Thursday after, we'll do our final review. This is it. That's the whole semester. Thank you all so much for sticking through and give yourselves a pat on the back. This is a lot of fucking work, and y'all have done a lot of great work to get through. So appreciate y'all being here. Uh, have a good one. Bye.